was in 1973 when 23-year-old Althea Dale Blankenship and her four-year-old son, Jeffrey, moved to Port Townsend, close to the Puget Sound in Washington. Althea had spent her early life in Virginia before moving to Washington with her family. She graduated from Shoreline High School, Washington in 1967, and two years later, her son Jeffrey was born. Althea had set her sights on creating a better life for the pair. Contemporary news articles do not mention whether Jeffrey's father was in the picture, and it appears he has never been named publicly. After spending a few years in Shoreline, Althea decided to move 50 miles to Port Townsend, Washington. Althea's parents, Oscar and Mary Marks, owned a home in Port Townsend and she wanted herself and her son to be closer to her parents. The move was a breath of fresh air for the two, and they rented a room from Glenn Allen Bagley. According to local news reports, Althea and Glenn developed a romantic interest in one another. Unfortunately, little is known about Althea's time in Port Townsend. We do know that, at the time, Glenn Bagley was separated from his wife, Esther Mae Jessler. Just three years after Althea and Jeffrey were last seen, Esther too would disappear. She was last seen in Auburn, Washington on March 13, 1976, leaving home in her blue Mercury station wagon. By 1976, Esther had remarried and was training to become a paralegal. On the day that Esther disappeared, she told her second husband that she was going to rent a hotel room so she could be alone to study. While the disappearance of Esther and Althea have never been officially connected, it is hard to ignore the striking similarities. Althea and her son Jeffrey were last seen on March 27, 1973, at or close to the apartment that they shared with Glenn Bagley. Before we proceed, I've got an exciting surprise for you. We've launched a brand new channel dedicated to intriguing content such as old historical mysteries, cold cases, and particularly chilling horror stories perfect for bedtime. Drop a comment letting us know if you're a fan of horror stories or not. You can find the link in the description below. Let's find out who will be the first to explore it. Alright, let's dive back into the video. That day, Althea and Jeffrey were due to travel to the Seattle-Tacoma International Airport. From there, they had plans to fly to New York City and catch a connecting flight to Greece to meet up with Althea's parents, who were already holidaying there. Unfortunately, Althea and Jeffrey never made it to their flights and have never been seen or heard from again. Glenn is believed to be the last person to have seen the pair alive. He told the Kent Police Department that on March 27th, he dropped Althea and Jeffrey off at the Seattle-Tacoma International Airport, which was the last time he saw them. Investigators doubted his story, but without solid evidence, they were unable to move forward with the conviction. While searching Althea's room, they uncovered letters between the two that exposed their romantic relationship, which had previously been unknown. Following the 1976 disappearance of Esther, authorities ramped up their investigation of him. Glenn soon caught wind of the police attention that he'd garnered and had moved to the Philippines to escape the heat. Glenn Allen Bagley never returned to the United States, passing away in 2016 from cancer. According to the Charlie Project, the Kent Police Department tried to build a case against him for many years, but were always unsuccessful. An ex-girlfriend of Bagley later told investigators that he had not been building a cat house on the day of Esther's disappearance as he had told law enforcement. She refused to tell the police anything else as Glenn had threatened her, telling her, quote, you will end up in the same culvert in Kinzing as Esther. Searches for Althea, Jeffrey, and Esther have been conducted, but nothing has been found so far. In 1973, burned and charred human remains were discovered on Protection Island, just off of Discovery Bay. Unfortunately, the chain of custody is somewhat murky on these remains, with the Port Townsend leader reporting, the remains pulled from the island burn pile in 1973 were transferred to the University of Washington's Anthropology Lab. It was concluded that the University of Washington had no documentation of those remains, nor several other associated records from that era. Althea Dale Blankenship is described as a Caucasian female with brown hair, blue eyes, 5 feet 7 inches, and 135 to 140 pounds. Jeffrey Dean Blankenship was described as a white male with brown hair, brown eyes, 3 feet 5 inches, and 75 pounds. Anyone with information is asked to contact Detective John Thompson of the Kent Police. 
What are your thoughts about this case? Let us know in the comment section down below. It was on September 29, 1980, approximately five miles from Ashland, Virginia, at around 6.30 p.m. when firefighters were attempting to put out a brush fire when they came across the burned remains of a young woman. She was found on a gravel dirt road that would be later named Wesley's Court, just off of what is now Greenwood Church Road, approximately 12 minutes outside of Ashland. The woman was able to be identified quickly through dental records. She was Patricia Eve Gagler. Not much is known about the young woman, but she was 28 years old. She was moving from her hometown in Pottstown, Pennsylvania to live with her brother in Richmond, Virginia. Authorities would discover that she had last been seen on September 29th, around 3 p.m. at a Sunoco gas station in Ashland, Virginia. News reports from 1980 stated that she'd been there to get a used car tire. They would also discover her vehicle on the dirt road near the fire. An autopsy was performed and the medical examiner stated that Patricia had died from an upper airways burns due to immolation or death by fire. They said that she had most likely died within seconds of her airways being burned. They also stated that they didn't find any other wounds on her body as well as no evidence of sexual assault. They could not determine if she had been conscious at the time of her death and her death was ultimately ruled a homicide. There has been no speculation that the killer had started the fire or it had already been started and just utilized. No suspect has ever been reported to the public. There's no record that Patricia had been married at any point in her life. Her last known occupation had been stated as a waitress on her death certificate. Both of her parents passed away in 2010 and 2012, and they never got to know what happened to their daughter. Patricia was last seen at that gas station and she'd only been about 30 minutes from Richmond, Virginia. Law enforcement has always been stumped on why she'd been on that road going in the wrong direction when she was last seen on the main road to Richmond. Authorities have never released much about this case and details for this are significantly lacking. In January 2022, deputies from the Hanover County Sheriff's Department asked the public to come forward with any information regarding the case of Patricia E. Gagler. What are your thoughts about this case? Let us know in the comment section down below. 30-year-old Sheila Sue Connor was described as a loving and caring mother to her 8-year-old son David. Sheila's life hadn't always been easy, with her son telling local news outlets that she'd been subjected to violence from a young age. Despite her challenging beginnings, Sheila was a kind and gentle soul who ensured her son would never have to face the same hardships she did. The two lived together in Houston, Texas, and things were going well for a while. That was until December 31, 1991. David's only memory of that day was being pulled out of the bath and being told to dry off and put on some clothes as quickly as possible. Houston police officers crouched to his level and told him the devastating news. His beloved mother was missing. At eight years old, this was hard for David to comprehend, and it took several years for him to be able to process that day entirely. According to reports, Sheila was last seen at Echo Glen Lane at the home of her boyfriend. The man with whom Sheila was in a relationship was much older than her, and her friends and family worried for her safety. Sheila was considerably more vulnerable as she was battling with addiction at the time of her disappearance. The last known contact from Sheila Connor came at 3.30 a.m. when she called a friend from her boyfriend's home in North Houston. She told a friend that she and him had gotten into an argument and that was the last time anyone ever heard from Sheila. She was reported missing days later. When her missing person investigation began, her car was found abandoned and stripped down along Interstate 45 in New Haven, Texas. Sheila's boyfriend has never been publicly named, but David Connor believes his mother was murdered that night. David now works with the media to ensure his mother's name and story has never been forgotten. Sheila Sue Connor is described as a white female with brown hair, brown eyes, five foot, and 130 pounds. She has a scar on the right side of her chin and the following tattoos. A leaf on her left leg, a rose on her right breast, and a tattoo on her arm. She was last seen wearing a black jacket, blue jeans, and maybe wearing glasses. Her son is still hopeful that someone with information will come forward and he can finally have some answers. What are your thoughts about this case? 
let us know in the comment section down below. March 30, 1980 marked a dark day in the history books Lake Erie, Ohio. That morning, the Sandusky police responded to a call about a bizarre object floating at the lake's edge. As they approached Cedar Point, officers realized the gravity of the situation. Backup was requested and the area was cordoned off from nosy residents. Unfortunately, there's limited information about the discovery. According to the Detroit Free Press, the Sandusky Police Department found the body of a young woman. She was aged 20 to 30. She was 5 feet 5 inches and 120 pounds, wearing what they described as a disco-style dress slumped at the edge of Lake Erie. The discovery rocked the community and investigators immediately set about identifying their victim. Unfortunately, this initial piece of the investigation would never come to be. Sandusky police did not release the woman's manner of death, which remains a point of contention. An autopsy revealed that the woman had several broken bones. Her femur, pelvis, and jaw were all shattered. However, the medical examiner couldn't be sure if the injuries had happened pre- or post-mortem. Several press releases and conferences were held, but nobody recognized the young woman in the size 12 disco dress. The case immediately went stale. There were no scars, jewelry pieces, or other identifying features on her body. In time, the woman was buried as the Erie County Jane Doe. There was no date of birth to adorn her grave, just March 30, 1980. The Sandusky Police Department never gave up on the Erie County Jane Doe, but with limited evidence and resources, the case could not progress. It would take decades for the name Erie County Jane Doe to appear in the media again, but there was good news this time. In late 2021, the Porchlight Project, a nonprofit organization that helps to fund the solving of coal cases, announced that they would be willing to pay for the new DNA testing in the Erie County Jane Doe case. By 2021, genetic genealogy was beginning to peak, and the Sandusky Police Department believed this may be their only chance to close this case once and for all. Shortly after accepting the donation, the woman's remains were sent to Bode Technology in Virginia for further testing. DNA analysis. Unfortunately, this kind of testing isn't instantaneous. Technicians worked exceedingly hard to research, prepare, and test samples for years. Almost two years later, in March 2023, Sandusky Police Department and the Portslight Project announced that the Erie County Jane Doe had been identified as 31-year-old Patricia Eleanor Greenwood. The announcement came on March 30th, 43 years to the day since she was discovered. Analysis found Patricia after discovering that she was one of 12 children who had been given up for adoption. Patricia was born in 1948 in Michigan and has lived in Traverse City, Bay City, and Saginaw. Patricia was never reported missing and her siblings last saw her in 1979. The Sandusky Police Department is still working on Patricia's cold case. And while she has been identified, it's anything but closed. According to Patricia's sister, she may have been a sex worker at the time of her death and the Sandusky Police Department believed that Patricia met with foul play. Unfortunately, no one in her family had a photograph of Patricia and law enforcement is hoping to find anyone who knew her to come forward as they'd like to get a better picture of what her life was like. Hopefully, with that information, they can be one step closer to finding her killer. Nick Edwards, a board member for Project Porchlight, gave this statement to the media regarding Patricia's case. Quote, Being able to give Patricia Greenwood her name back is the first step in finding the justice that she deserves. Thank you to the brilliant folks at Vode for the wonderful work that they do. Vode continues to impress, and their assistance to those in law enforcement is making it more difficult for bad people to get away with bad things. The Sandusky Police Department never gave up on this victim. Even after all these years, now it's time for the public to come together and provide information about Patricia Greenwood to the detectives. Patricia needs your help. What are your thoughts about this case? Let us know in the comment section down below. It was on February 16, 1986, when hikers along the Pacific Crest Trail made a grisly discovery at the Los Coyotes Indian Reservation. The partially decomposed body of a woman lay at the edge of the campsite. San Diego County Sheriff's Office was immediately dispatched to the scene and began their investigation. 
Moments later, the San Diego County Sheriff's Office received a call that would change everything. 14 miles from where the female victim was, there was found a man in a similar condition. Both victims were wearing thick jackets and layers of clothing. The similarities were too apparent to ignore, and investigators knew they had to identify both bodies before their killer could be identified. Law enforcement has withheld a lot of information in both of these cases. The manner of death of the man found 14 miles away has never been released to preserve the investigation's integrity. Detectives struggled to make any headway in either case. There was very little evidence, and the evidence the SDCSO did have was being withheld from the media. Her murder floated through the media for a few weeks before interest fizzled out. For decades, her case would go untouched. But the San Diego County Sheriff's Office knew there was family out there looking for their loved one. In 2023, the San Diego County Sheriff's Office turned to genetic genealogy. A sample of the woman's hair was submitted for analysis on websites such as 23andMe and GEDmatch. According to CBS, quote, using this DNA analysis, as well as census records and other public information, detectives were able to build family trees and track down relatives. Investigators had now identified the family tree, and all they had to do was find the missing link. Shortly after her DNA was submitted, law enforcement identified the Jane Doe as Claudette Jean Zabulski Powers. The mother of two would have been 24 years old when she was brutally murdered. Detectives pieced together what they knew of her life before she disappeared. In the early 1980s, Claudette left her Michigan home and moved to Washington with her husband. By 1983, Claudette filed for divorce and found a property in San Diego County for herself and her daughters. However, in 1984, tragedy struck the Powers family when their patriarch passed away. Upon losing her father, Claudette felt lost. Her siblings recalled to officers that September 1984 was the last time they saw or spoke to their beloved sister at their father's funeral. After that, she dropped off the map. Her siblings hired a private investigator, but there is no sign. Her siblings and family loved Claudette, and they knew her disappearance was out of the ordinary. However, she was never reported missing formally, and her family had no idea that she'd been deceased all these years. Whilst Claudette has now been identified, investigators still have a long way to go in this investigation. They are now tasked with piecing Claudette's life together from September 1984 to 1986. There are some reports that she worked as a waitress in Escondido and anyone with information or may have known Claudette is asked to come forward. Her sister said in a statement to the media, quote, It's been really hard on our family. Someone knows what happened. A neighbor... Anyone that knew her knows what happened. If you're still alive and you knew my sister and you knew what happened to her, please come forward. Please, we need closure. San Diego County Sheriff's Office has not released the manners of the death for Claudette or the John Doe, and the investigation is ongoing. What they have said is that they are looking for a male suspect and that Claudette had suffered a violent death. They are hoping to identify the man who had been murdered, as well they said that the man is a similar age to Claudette mid-twenties and that they were both similarly dressed in thermals and clothing suitable for camping they had both been deceased for, approximately two weeks before their bodies were discovered. No other personal effects were found and no camping gear, bags, or purses. The area was remote and they would have needed a vehicle to get there. At this time, there are no sketches of John Doe available, nor much information that might help identify him. What are your thoughts about this case? Let us know in the comment section down below. On October 26, 1976, the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Department were called to the Talisman Sugar Farm in Palm Beach County, Florida. This case would be like no other, sending investigators on an ever-twisting turning path. In the cane field lay the body of a man who was later believed to be white or Native American. His remains were somewhat skeletonized and that he had been exposed to the ailments for at least two months before his discovery. Forensic experts deemed his death a homicide with the gunshot wound to the back of his skull as the cause of death. He had a unique Timex watch with the initials LJ carved on the inside. Investigators also discovered that Palm Beach County John Doe had been shot three times overall. Over the years, several forensic photography experts have created several renditions of what he may have looked like in life, 
but these failed to produce any leads. In 2022, author the nonprofit organization joined forces with the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. Their press release from Orthrum states, quote, this case was entered into name us as up 1300. The Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office sent skeletal remains for the unidentified homicide victim to Othram. After many months of hard work, the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office announced that the as 29-year-old Douglas Lindstreeter. In April 1976, Douglas and a group of friends traveled from his hometown of Bryan, Ohio to Florida on a boy's trip in March 1976. According to Douglas' friends, he was last seen in the vicinity of the Spanish Oaks Apartments in Boca Raton, Florida in April 1976. He went by the nickname Strut. From Florida, it seems he became separated from his friends and disappeared. His friends returned home without him. His estimated time of death was around August, but he disappeared in April. No one knows what he'd been doing in the months between his disappearance and murder. What are your thoughts about this case? Let us know in the comment section down below. Before we proceed, I've got an exciting surprise for you. We've launched a brand new channel dedicated to intriguing content such as old historical mysteries, cold cases, and particularly chilling horror stories perfect for bedtime. Drop a comment letting us know if you're a fan of horror stories or not. You can find the link in the description below. Let's find out who will be the first to explore it. Alright, let's dive back into the video. In early May 2010, a man walked up to a couple of unhoused men in Santa Monica, California. He offered the men $1,000 to split if they'd kill someone for him. One of the unhoused men who went by Big Dave said he was uncomfortable killing in public. The man with the money offered to come back later and show him how to get into his house. After Big Dave went to his police liaison officer and told them what the man had planned, law enforcement would set up a sting operation and Big Dave agreed to wear a wire for the event. They would discover that this man was Juan Carlos Cruz, a Food Network celebrity chef with the show Calorie Commando. Juan Carlos Cruz moved to the United States when he was three years old with his family from the Dominican Republic. He reported being fascinated with cooking his whole life. He went to culinary school in California with a focus on pastry. After graduating, he got a job as the salt pastry chef at the Hotel Bel Air. He made pastries for famous stars like Oprah, Jack Nicholson, and Julia Roberts before landing himself in TV. He was married to his high school sweetheart, Jennifer Campbell. Law enforcement quickly discovered that it was his beloved wife Jennifer who had been the intended target of the hit. On May 12th, Cruz would take Big Dave to his apartment and show him how to get in undetected. He gave him the code to the security system, and he told Big Dave to slit Jennifer's throat, but later changed his mind to strangulation, so there wouldn't be much of a mess to clean up. It was all for the relatively low sum of $1,000, but he gave the men strict instructions not to harm his dogs. He even offered to provide the men with dog treats so that their dogs wouldn't alert anyone when he entered the apartment. Once law enforcement had what they needed, they arrested Cruz, who was charged with attempted murder and solicitation to commit murder. He would plead not guilty. But by October 2010, he pleaded no contest to the solicitation to commit murder, and the prosecution dropped the attempted murder charge. He was sentenced in December 2010 to nine years in prison with the option of parole at four and a half years. Later, it would come out in the media that Cruz was alleging that he wanted to hire the men because his wife had been very depressed following multiple failed fertility treatments. They had spent over $200,000 on the treatment and were out of options. After the last round didn't work, his wife is reported to have wanted to kill herself but couldn't do it for religious reasons. Cruz is alleged to have attempted to hire Hitman as an act of mercy, so his wife didn't take her own life, though his story changed multiple times over the course of the investigation. During the trial, his wife could be seen in the courtroom. After the conviction and sentencing, Cruz was not talked about in the media again. It is believed that he's still married to his wife. He would have been eligible for parole in 2015 if he'd finished his whole sentence. He would have been released in 2019. What are your thoughts about this case? Let us know in the comment section down below. On April 16, 2004, Mike Danton, 24, 
was arrested for conspiracy to commit murder in a murder-for-hire plot that crossed state lines. Mike Danton, formerly Mike Jefferson, was a Canadian NFL hockey player. He was drafted in 2000 and was the 135th pick by the New Jersey Devils. He was ultimately traded to the St. Louis Blues, where he played his last game in the NFL. Danton was born and raised in Brampton, Ontario. He said to have had a strained relationship with his family. He formed a close relationship with his coach, David Frost. Frost was also the coach of Sheldon Keefe, who the NFL would also draft in 1999, a year earlier. He would go on to become the head coach for the Toronto Maple Leafs. In his mid-30s in 2004, David Frost would become Danton and Keefe's agent within the NFL. Some were surprised by this because David Frost had been banned from several junior hockey leagues in Canada. He was accepted into the NFL Players Association as an agent. David Frost was very involved. Some would say he controlled what Danton could and couldn't do, making it so Danton had to come to Frost for every issue about his career. So what happened with Mike Danton? The FBI's order of events was at Mike Danton while in the playoffs in San Jose, California against the San Jose Sharks Mike Danton called a woman that he'd had a brief relationship with, Katie Wolfmeyer, asking if she knew anyone who could help him hire someone for $10,000 to have someone killed. Katie then got Danton in touch with her acquaintance, Justin Levi Jones. Some reports say that Jones was with Katie when she first got the call and offered to help unknown to both Katie and Danton. Jones was a law enforcement officer in St. Louis. Jones reported that plan to the authorities, who then set up a recording so that Jones could accept the hit. Danton would ask Jones to kill the person that was staying in his apartment in the next few days. Danton would say he was afraid for his life and that the person coming in was coming to hurt him. Jones was asked to make it look like a burglary gone wrong, and the person who was in the apartment at that time was David Frost. The FBI would stipulate that Danton had a fight with Frost over his behavior of drinking and partying, and that Danton was worried that Frost would tell the NFL team about it, so that he wanted to have Frost killed before he could. Frost would deny to the media that he was the intended target even today. Danton and Frost would have multiple phone conversations while Danton was in jail awaiting trial until a judge banned communication between the two. The FBI had released some of these conversations. They would show a unique relationship between the two, including Frost telling Danton, if you love me, you should say it, with Danton ending the phone call with I love you. These phone conversations would bring some speculation of a more of a relationship between the two, but it's never been confirmed. While awaiting trial, Danton lawyers had him evaluated by a psychologist. It is believed that they might have tried to mount an insanity defense, but in July 2004, Danton pleaded guilty to the federal conspiracy to commit murder. Because the phone call had crossed state lines, it was a federal case from the beginning. When he pleaded guilty, he said David Frost had been the intended target. Prosecutors allowed Danton to apply to be moved to a Canadian prison facility as he pleaded guilty. At that time, Danton's lawyers hoped to get him moved quickly because it was believed that they could get him better help in Canada as that prison system had better counseling opportunities for inmates. Mike Danton was sentenced on November 9, 2004 to seven and a half years. In March 2009, after five years in federal prison, the United States Bureau of Prisons approved Mike Danton's transfer to a Canadian prison. On September 11, 2009, Mike Danton was released from prison on parole. Conditions of his parole include no face-to-face -face meetings with David Frost and no contact with his father. Katie Wolfmeyer was also arrested on the same charge of conspiracy to commit murder. Her case went to trial as she turned down a two-year plea deal. She was eventually acquitted of all charges on September 2004. Mike Danton didn't testify at her trial. After being convicted, Mike Danton revealed that his intended target was his father. Danton said that he'd feared for his life around his father when he'd been abused by his father both physically and sexually. Mike Danton's father has denied this all and blames David Frost for his son's behavior and career downfall. There are multiple allegations against Frost for sexual harassment from other NFL and junior NFL players. He was charged in 2008 and went to trial but was acquitted in the end due to insufficient evidence. His systematic abuse appears to be an open secret in the NFL. According to sources, he has moved to the USA and works at a hockey academy in California under a new name. The FBI is adamant that David Frost was the intended target, 
but both Frost and Danton have stated multiple times since then that it had been his father. Mike Danton took a university course through correspondence. After Danton's release, he went to university in January 2010 at St. Mary's University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. There he joined the university hockey team, the Huskies, and played his first game since 2004 in January 2010. His team would win the Canadian University Cup that year. He would eventually return to professional hockey. He was drafted into a Swedish professional hockey league in 2011, and he played his last professional game on a Polish team in 2017. Mike Danton now lives in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and says that gonna jail changed his life, that, quote, I was in a pretty messed up state at the time, that's for sure, and it's big reason why I went for psychology in my undergrad, and now I'm working towards my major in sports psychology. He now runs the Mike Danton Hockey Academy and works with future hockey players. What are your thoughts about this case? Let us know in the comments section down below. On May 4, 2001, 44-year-old Bonnie Lee Blakely was discovered to have been shot twice in her husband's car while he went to get something he'd left in the restaurant Fatello's in Los Angeles, California. The husband was famed actor Robert Blake, and the item he forgot at the restaurant was a handgun he'd alleged fell out of his pocket while dining. The restaurant was near the home he shared with his wife. Robert Blake was a well-known actor born in 1933. His first film credit was in 1939 working as a child actor. Born Michael James Vincenzo Gubitasi, the production company he worked for MGM suggested the name change to Bobby or Robert Blake. His most infamous role was the lead in a TV show called Barada and the 1967 movie In Cold Blood. Robert Blake would quickly be looked at with suspicion after his wife's death. Blake would tell police that he was not with his wife when she was shot because he'd returned to the restaurant to retrieve a gun that had fallen from his pocket. He told police he was carrying the weapon to protect his wife as she had a criminal past. Bonnie Lee Backley was married to Robert Blake only six months after a paternity test proved that Backley's daughter, who had initially been named Christian Shannon Brando, named because Blakely originally believed this child's father to be Christian Brando, son of famous actor Marlon Brando. After the test proved that Blake was the father, her name was changed to Rose Lenore Sophia Blake, and the two were wed shortly after. Robert Blake was Bonnie's tenth husband. Some of her marriages only lasted one day. Two she'd met at a jazz club. She was reported to seek out older men, some famous, some for money. Her longest marriage was only five years. She had four children in total. After the shooting, information on who Bonnie was came to life. She was known to be a con woman who would put out ads in magazines, and if a man answered the ad, she would send provocative pictures of herself in hopes that they would reach out to her and she could convince them to give her money or even blackmail them. Some reports have said that she even used her eldest daughter to entrap men. Friends of Bonnie admitted that she was obsessed with celebrities, and she not only tried to become famous in her own right, but she'd do anything to marry a star. Some of her cons would get her arrested. In 1989, she was arrested on drug-related charges. In 1995, she was arrested for check fraud. And in 98, she was arrested again for fraud having possessed multiple driver's licenses and social security cards. She was sentenced to three years probation. She was still on probation when she met Robert Blake. Bonnie is alleged to have used men to get ahead and put herself in the limelight. So it was said that when she snagged a real Hollywood star and established actor with a storied career, it had been a dream come true. But the feeling wasn't shared with her new husband. Law enforcement revealed to the press that the gun Blake had left in the restaurant had been tested, and it was confirmed to have not been used to shoot Bonnie. However, on the day of the murder, Blake was tested for gunshot residue on his hands and clothes and tested positive. There were no witnesses to the crime. A busser from the restaurant would later contradict the account and say that there was no gun left at the restaurant when he cleared the table right after the couple had left. The murder weapon was discovered in a garbage dumpster near the crime scene with one bullet still in the chamber. It was noted as being an unusual vintage revolver. The gun wasn't registered to Blake, and law enforcement couldn't find a connection to any owner. Robert Blake's home was searched, with authorities finding similar ammunition to that used in the murder and reported that three bullets were missing from the box. It took nearly a year for the prosecution to gather enough evidence, 
and in April 2002, Robert Blake was arrested at his sister's home. He'd been staying there with his daughter. He was charged with two counts of solicitation of murder and one count with special circumstances, which meant that the star could face the death penalty. Earl Caldwell, Blake's bodyguard, was also arrested and charged. Allegations that the star had asked two stunt performers that had formerly worked with Blake if they could kill his wife reported having offered the men $10,000. Both men have stated that they refused the offer and testified at his trial. However, it was deemed suspicious that neither man went to law enforcement sooner with the information. Authorities believe that Robert Blake had killed his wife himself after he had tried and failed to hire someone to kill her. Blake is reported to have felt trapped in his marriage to Blakely and just wanted it to end. He had hired a private investigator to dig into Bonnie's past, and it was only then that he discovered Bonnie had continued her lonely heart scam even after they were married, which included sending nude photographs. It was later revealed that the two never lived together. Bonnie lived in a guest house on Blake's property, and the two shared custody of Rose. It was revealed that the couple had a tumultuous relationship, and I think that's kind of an understatement. Blake never truly trusted his new wife. Her pregnancy had been unexpected to say the least, and letters between the two revealed how they discussed at great lengths about what to do about the pregnancy. Though it wasn't just Robert Blake who had motive to murder Bonnie, she had swindled men across the country, some out of their entire life savings. After her murder, records were discovered in her home, meticulously detailed ledgers with who sent her money, when and for how much. Friends of Bonnie revealed that her victims had often threatened her. They also stated that Bonnie had told them that Robert Blake threatened to kill her. She told her brother she thought that Robert might murder her. After Robert Blake was arrested, he spent almost a year behind bars before a bail was set at $1.5 million. He was kept on house arrest until the trial. Blake also paid the $1 million bond for his bodyguard. The trial started in December 2004 and lasted until March 2005. Blake was initially found not guilty of murder and one of the solicitations of murder charges. The second charge was dropped after the jury was deadlocked at 11 to 1 for acquittal. Blake's acquittal had left mixed feelings in the press. Some believed he was still guilty. Blakely's three oldest children filed a civil case against Robert Blake stating he was responsible for Bonnie's death. In November 2005, the civil jury found that Robert Blake was liable for the wrongful death of his wife. He was ordered to pay $30 million. In 2006, Blake filed for bankruptcy. He attempted to appeal the decision in 2007, in which the court upheld the verdict, but changed the awarded money to $15 million. In civil court, Earl Caldwell, Blake's bodyguard, was also acquitted and found not liable for the death. After the acquittal and bankruptcy, Blake maintained a low profile, only doing a few interviews now and again. In 2019, he started a YouTube channel called Robert Blake. I ain't dead yet, so stay tuned. That same year would be the first time Rose would come forward to talk about her life since her mother's death. Rose had been 11 months old when her mother died, and since had lived with Blake's oldest daughter, Delilah. Rose didn't see her father after she turned five, and in 2019, she visited her father for the first time since then. In an interview, she said to have talked about an interest in acting and knowing the truth about what happened to her mother. She didn't comment if she believed her father had done it. After all the legal fees and civil judgments paid, Robert Blake was broke. He lived off his Social Security and the Screen Actor Guild's pension for the rest of his life. In March 2023, Robert Blake died at the age of 89 of heart disease. Bonnie Lee Backley's murder remains unsolved. What are your thoughts about this case? Let us know in the comment section down below. Before we proceed, I've got an exciting surprise for you. We've launched a brand new channel dedicated to intriguing content such as old historical mysteries, cold cases, and particularly chilling horror stories perfect for bedtime. Drop a comment letting us know if you're a fan of horror stories or not. You can find the link in the description below. Let's find out who will be the first to explore it. Alright, let's dive back into the video. It was on Monday, February 2nd, 1987, when Maria Pacheco took her newborn son, Elias Monroy Jr. for a routine checkup at the LA-USC Medical Center in Los Angeles. 
Elias was only two weeks old and was born happy and healthy, but it had been a difficult delivery for Maria. Maria was still recovering from a cesarean section and was experiencing a lot of pain which was making it difficult to walk and get around. While in the clinic waiting room, Maria was approached by a woman in her 30s who said she was a mother as well. The two chatted for a bit and Maria thought the woman was friendly and honest. So when Elias started to cry, Maria dug through her diaper bag but realized she didn't bring enough bottles. The woman offered to hold Elias while she went to look for some formula and Maria accepted. Maria had only been gone for a few minutes. When she returned, she noticed the woman was gone, and so was her son. At first, it was thought that the woman had simply gone into her appointment and had taken the newborn with her, but no one matching her description was identified as a patient there or had an appointment. Little Elias had been kidnapped. When detectives started investigating the abduction, detectives in Asperia, California reached out with a similar abduction attempt on January 14th. In that case, a woman who had similarities to the description of the L.A. abductor approached a woman in a post office who was with her four-month-old son. This woman had started chatting with the mother and had asked to hold the baby, which the mother declined. She left the post office and continued running her errands. Later on in the day, she arrived at a Safeway. She parked and was unbuckling her son from the car seat when she noticed the woman from the post office barreling towards her. The woman was screaming, I want the baby, I want the baby, and tried to rip the little boy from his mother's arms. And it was then that she noticed that there was a man with the woman this time. The mother kicked at the woman knocking her back. Then the man tried to take the child from her arms and she kicked him as well, getting him between the legs, and she ran with her child into the grocery store. She was helped by the store employees, but the two child abductors ran off. By the time law enforcement arrived, they were long gone. The woman was described as Hispanic, 30 to 35 years old, around 5 feet 7 inches and 150 pounds. Both said that she had a dark complexion and Maria said that the woman had long brown hair but the ends were frosted blonde. The mother didn't get a good look at the man and there wasn't a description of him. Unfortunately, there are no photographs of Elias, but a new age progression image has been generated to show what he may look like today. Elias is Hispanic with brown hair and brown eyes. At the time of his abduction, he weighed 8 pounds and was 1 foot 9 inches long. He would be 36 years old today and is believed he was abducted by a woman to be raised as her own. He may still be in the California area. He may believe he was adopted as a child. Maria put out a plea out to social media saying, quote, Elias, look for me, communicate with me. I am your mom and you were my dream come true, but someone took you from me. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children is very hopeful in identifying Elias and reuniting him with his family. Anyone who recognizes Elias from the age progression image or the sketch of the abductor is asked to contact the LAPD. What are your thoughts about this case? Let us know in the comment section down below. It was on April 5, 1975, when two-year-old Christopher Bush was left unattended in a vehicle at a grocery store parking lot in the Germantown neighborhood of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He had been left in the care of a babysitter, 26-year-old Patricia Warwick, at the time and had been with her for two weeks prior following a fire that destroyed the Bush home. Christopher's mother, Gwendolyn, was staying with relatives with her three other children while they found a new home that would accommodate all of the children again. When Patricia returned to the 1966 Maroon Ford station wagon after shopping, she discovered that Christopher wasn't there. All that was left was the hat that he'd been wearing. She searched the surrounding area but found no sign of the toddler, finally calling the police an hour later. Precious time had been lost and the investigation turned up little information. Over 100 officers searched for days. But nothing came up. Patricia swore that she had left the car doors locked. There was no sign of a break-in. However, someone could have easily convinced Christopher to unlock the door. Car seats weren't mandatory in the U.S. until 1986, so it's likely that he was just sitting in the back seat. Alternatively, she might have forgotten to check all the doors of the car. Either way, someone got in. Patricia claimed that she had only been in the store for 10 minutes before coming back to the vehicle. 
so the window for the abduction was relatively short. Christopher Bush is described at the time of his abduction as a black male, 2 foot 10 and 40 pounds. He was wearing a denim jacket with a white fur trimmed collar and a light blue corduroy pants. He was born in 1973 and may have been adopted out in 1975. The case remains unsolved and there's been little movement in the case since 1975, though there are hopes that he will be found and reunited with his family. Christopher would have been 50 years old today and may have grown up in the Pennsylvania area. What are your thoughts about this case? Let us know in the comment section down below. It was on April 27, 1974, when five-year-old Cynthia Lynn Sumter was playing outside on the front lawn of the apartment building she lived in with her mother in San Jose, California. Cynthia's mother, Linda, left around noon to pick up sandwiches for lunch. But while she was gone, she asked a neighbor to watch her daughter. When she returned about an hour later, Cynthia hadn't come in for lunch yet. She looked outside but couldn't see her out front. For 30 minutes, she searched by herself but opted to call the police, who gathered a 50-person search party to look for the little girl. Dozens of leads came in, but it appeared that the girl had vanished without a trace. One lead from a witness stated that they saw a little girl matching Cynthia's description in a blue car driven by a young man with blonde hair and a mustache. However, this sighting was never confirmed by a secondary witness, so it's hard to know if this was a credible sighting. That she needed to drop the criminal charge against his brother to see Cynthia again, along with $1,000 cash. Five weeks before the abduction, Cynthia had been molested by a boy who lived next door. Linda had pressed criminal charges. It was determined that the boys didn't have Cynthia and were charged with attempted extortion. Cynthia's parents had divorced a year earlier and in the early days of the investigation, both accused the other of kidnapping the child. Both were investigated and asked to take polygraph tests, which they both passed. They were ultimately ruled out as suspects. Another suspect was Antonio Madrid, a neighbor who lived 100 yards from the apartment building. Madrid committed suicide two days after the abduction. Law enforcement later found a shirt with blood on it and blonde hairs in his vehicle. His unclear genetic testing had been done on those items. Convicted killer Eugene Joseph Wesley was also investigated about Cynthia's disappearance. While connected to a polygraph machine, it showed deception, leading detectives to believe he knew more than he was saying. However, law enforcement stopped investigating him when he died in prison. At the time of her disappearance, Cynthia is wearing a red and white striped tank top with a blue star on the front and purple pants. She was barefoot. She is described as white with blonde hair and blue eyes. She has a cowluck on the right side of her hairline and a mole on the left side of her neck and shin. Her nickname is Cindy and she often went by both Cindy or Cynthia. Linda believes Cynthia is still alive. A body was never found, nor any evidence that would point to the contrary. In a statement to the media, she said, quote, I pray every day that God will bring her back into my life sometime here on this earth, not just in heaven that I can hold her one more time and tell her how much I loved her. The San Jose Police Department is hopeful in solving the Cole case and is asking anyone with information to come forward, as without it, the case will likely go unsolved. In a statement to the media, they said, quote, Even after this many years, someone out there has information that can be helpful to the San Jose Police. We won't close this case until she is physically found. What are your thoughts about this case? Let us know in the comment section down below. It was on September 20, 1991 on Staten Island, New York, when the body of a woman was discovered in a patch of weeds along a dirt road. The woman had been handcuffed, severely beaten with a hammer, and strangled to death. Her body was then set ablaze. The murder weapon was found under her body with the name Lloyd L. carved into the handle. The woman remained unidentified for three decades, known for all those years as Jane Doe with the scorpion tattoo. The Cole case was opened in 2023 when familial DNA gave her name back as Christine Belusco. Christine was 30 years old at the time of her murder. She had been a missing person since September 13, 1991, when she was last seen by family members. 
Christine had recently learned that she was adopted and had a falling out with her parents, who hadn't told her about the adoption until she was an adult. It had been a shock to Christine, and she told her family she was moving to Florida. That was the last she had been seen. Her family had no idea she'd been dead all these years. Her brother was the one to receive the notice that Christine had been identified as a Jane Doe. He asked if they had also found Krista. It was only then that law enforcement learned that Christine had a child who'd been with her at the last time she'd been seen. Her daughter had only been two at the time. Krista Nicole Belusco was last seen with her mother the Mount Airy Lodge in Mount Pinocho, Pennsylvania. Her family never knew who her father was. Law enforcement believe that finding Christine's killer will lead to finding Krista. They believe that Christine was killed by someone she knew and are hoping that finding the identity of Krista's father will point them in the right direction. Krista Nicole will be 33 years old today. Her birthday was August 1, 1989. She is described as Caucasian with brown hair and brown eyes. What are your thoughts about this case? Let us know in the comment section down below.